Hello, good afternoon, Triple E 190 students. My name is Nestor Tiglao, and I'm a professor here at the Triple E Institute. Uh, I'm with the uh, Ubiquitous Computing Laboratory. So this afternoon, I will present uh, a talk on presenting research data. So hopefully, you will uh, get some uh, basic understanding of how to present your data effectively, how to choose the kind of data presentation that you will uh, use, and hopefully enjoy the process of just preparing your data so that you, you can communicate it better to other people so that those people can benefit from the research that you have done. So let's go right into the, to the, to the talk. So why is a data presentation very important? Uh, it's important because data presentation and analysis plays an, an essential role in basically every field of endeavor. Uh, and here in the Triple Institute, uh, when you are in your senior year, you have to do your undergraduate research project. And you, of course, you have to present uh, your findings, your final output, and you should do it in a way that's effective and efficient so that, number one, the, um, advi your advisor will be able to appreciate what you have done. And the people in the audience will generally appreciate the work that you have done and how they can use that knowledge uh, if they want to in their own work as well. So, you did all the hard work uh, in coming up with the outputs, with your research. Now, when you present the data, it's your opportunity to share the information effectively so that other people will benefit from it. Uh, the ultimate goal is to make it easy for others to understand your findings and appreciate your message. So even if it's a very complicated topic, even if you did a lot of very uh, difficult uh, research and you went through a lot of uh, steps to arrive at your conclusion, when you present that data, the goal is always to make it easy for others to appreciate and understand your findings. Okay. So this, I could not stress this uh, uh, enough because it's very important that you, that we even as engineers and scientists, that we should be able to communicate effectively. And sometimes it's, it's not really in uh, the output per se, but how we communicate our outputs that make or break our presentation and even our, uh, our work later on. So what uh, we can follow is that there's a simple procedure for presenting your, your data. So there's a three-step process that I would like to suggest to you. And this is something that uh, can be applied uh, with almost any kind of data or research data that you need to present. So the step one is choose the appropriate way of presenting your data. So uh, data could be very complex or could, very, could, be, could be simple. But if you do not choose the appropriate way of presenting it, you might unnecessarily complicate uh, the data and the message that you are trying to convey. Number two, you should ensure that the data is visually appealing and you present your data in a clear and concise and effective manner. So uh, most, uh, in, for example, uh, in, in in marketing and advertising, they have to, they have this, what they call a three second rule. If you look at, if you go through EDSA or any, any highway, uh, 
we will see big billboards. And usually uh, people who are commuting will only have three seconds to view that billboard or that sign. And the, their goal is to capture your attention and drive the message across in three seconds. So that is one good rule of thumb, because if we can convey our message effectively in three seconds, then we are very efficient and effective. And at the end of that three seconds, there will be a clear call to action uh, on the part of the one viewing that information, that data, then we will succeed in uh, presenting our data effectively. So number three is to choose the, the uh, or make a decision on, what, on how you present your data. So, and in general, there are three ways that you can present data, any kind of data. Number one is as text or textual information. Number two is in tabular form. And number three in graphical form. If you have any kind or any set of data, you can actually pr present that data, that set of data in any of these three ways. But there's, but you have to choose well because one kind of data presentation might not be very effective. So we have to know when to use each one, um, depending on our purpose, our goal, and the kind of data that we have. So let's go over the, the different or the three types of data presentation. So when we're using text, so here are some tips. Uh, keep it simple. So there's no need to, as much as possible, if you can limit the, uh, the kind of uh, words that you will use, the kind of sentences, uh, to make it simpler for the audience to understand and appreciate, then that would be more desirable. Secondly, uh, when you present your data after you have done the research, you use the past tense and use the active voice. Okay. Um, also, uh, there's a, a consensus or, or a uh, standard practice of using the third person when you uh, present the, the, the data uh, and describe your results. And the uh, number four tip here is to avoid extreme language. And most of these um, tips also apply when you write uh, your uh, research paper and submit it to a, either a conference or a journal. Uh, these four tips uh, really help in, in, because, uh, in uh, conveying your message because number one, the audience or the readers or even the reviewers of your paper may not be very familiar with uh, the specific approach that you're using in your research. They could be experts in, the, in that field, but they may not be uh, very familiar with the, with, with the way that you went about with your research. For example, the algorithm that you used, for example, the tools and techniques that you applied and what kind of data analysis uh, procedures you used. And uh, in, uh, related to avoiding extreme language, sometimes when we make claims and the claims are very restrictive or very, uh, uh, very limited, very narrow and very extreme, uh, it tends to polarize uh, and puts the reviewer or the audience at a uh, defensive uh, attitude. So as much as possible, we, we should avoid extreme language and qualify uh, our, uh, our, uh, our uh, sentences or our claims. We should clarify and explain because any given statement will have uh, limitations. Uh, 
So we should be we should be mindful that um, people may have different um, biases or they have different backgrounds. So they might tend to favor one um, position or the other. Uh, and in general, text is used for the interpretation of the data uh, because that's the main mode of uh, explaining your research. And it's also used for uh, detailed discussion and especially when you want to emphasize a point or a research uh, output. So here's an example down here. Uh, it explains a particular figure in the paper. And in general, you use uh, text when you want to emphasize one or two points uh, of that particular data. So in this case, we're, we're discussing some optimal value and we just identified where that optimal value is. So you, text is a very effective way to do this because if you use a, for example, a table or if you use a graph, then you would number one, use more uh, space because you have to uh, you have to uh, substantiate that, uh, and then you have to pinpoint where that uh, that optimal point is. For example, okay. So secondly, uh, using tabular form, when you uh, show or need, there's a need to show many and precise um, numerical values in a small space, it's preferable to use a table okay, as opposed to uh, using a graphical form or a figure. Uh, and that's because it's uh, when you use a tabular form, you use uh, text. Uh, organized in rows and columns, and you can specify very exact values. Um, you can also use this to compare and contrast the values or characteristics of different items. So they could be different uh, uh, quantities, not just, not just one uh, quantity. For example, if you can be comparing uh, temperature, and humidity in one table, okay, uh, and and those variables could be could have different uh, quantities. Okay, so here's an example of uh, two tables from a paper, and I'll show you uh, this paper later on uh, what the uh, what it contains in terms of data and how the data uh, in that paper were uh, presented. So as you can see, uh, you have here rows and columns. And what we're trying to compare here are different. Uh, FER is the frame error rate. Okay, so there's uh, it, 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 uh, the value varies from zero to 0 0.7. And on the columns, you have different kinds of protocols that we're trying to compare and see what the performance gains are over a uh, of this particular protocol that we developed over these other protocols that we're comparing. So as you can see, um, it's, uh, you, we can really show quali uh, quantitatively the values of the performance gains. Okay. And you can, uh, in this case, since there are two scenarios that we considered, scenario one and scenario two, we broke them up into separate tables. However, when you just use this uh, table, this normal table where there's no color uh, associated with it, sometimes it's, it's very difficult to, to see what the uh, uh, important points are. For example, if you want to show uh, uh, like uh, to, to look at trends, it's difficult to look at the trends when you're just using, uh, looking at uh, uh, individual values or numbers in this case. So sometimes uh, the use of heat maps is very effective in conveying a trend because here you have 
some kind of color information that will tell you uh, and let you identify where those, for example, high values are or low values are. Okay, or in this case, uh, you have the average monthly temperatures uh, over uh, the several years for uh, okay, for this particular location. As you can see, it's very easy. Uh, imagine if there were no colors here in the cells. Uh, it's difficult to see what the hottest uh, months are, or at least it's difficult to, to process it because you have, then you have to compare the numbers. Uh, but here you'll see right away that those in red, the cells in red, indicate the hottest months, and the, those in dark green are the coldest months. And you'll see this, you can actually see a, a trend. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, July to uh, maybe September are the hottest months, and it was during 2015 that they experienced uh, the longest, uh, maybe longest summer, for example, here, right? Okay. Uh, the last kind of data presentation is uh, using graphical form or figures. And these uh, type of data presentation is very effective in showing trends because trends and patterns as well as relationships across different data sets is difficult to show when you use either a text or a table, okay? So here, uh, uh, the trend, looking at the trend is more important than uh, looking at the precise data values. And also this is used to visually explain a sequence of events, phenomena, characteristics, or geographical features. Mm -hmm. So going back to our uh, paper, um, you'll see these graphs uh, later on. Uh, so these are scenarios one and scenario two. And we're looking at the four uh, protocols that we developed. So as you can see, since I want to emphasize the uh, the, uh, the new protocol that I'm, I, I developed and researched on, and it's called DTSN Plus, then I'll show it in, 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 in this case, blue. Uh, and then I'll show the other uh, uh, protocols that I compared with it in, in other colors, okay? And you'll see that uh, DTN Plus, in this case, if you look at this scenario one, and this is the good put, it performs a lot better, okay, than the other three protocols. And you see that also in scenario two, uh, it also performs uh, better than the other three, okay. Uh, if you look at these two graphs, these two graphs is the uh, are the exact. Uh, graphical equivalent of these two tables, okay? Although here, uh, these two tables shows the um, performance gain, but not, uh, not the actual uh, good put values, okay? okay. So it show, uh, so, so these are the three types of uh, uh, data presentation. Uh, so here's an example of a, a, a review, a reviewer comment in, in one of the papers that I submitted uh, before. And you see, should you, uh, uh, you will see this uh, kind of comments uh, uh, frequently in many of these uh, reviewers because they, they actually look at the quality of the paper by the way that you present your data, okay? So it shows here, it says here, the presentation of the results doesn't do justice to the overall quality of the paper. The figures show and print poorly and do not look professional. Please redraw them and make them look decent. I can hardly read the captions. Plus, don't forget that most people print in black and white, so forget about all those fancy colors. So as you can see, uh, there's a need to 
format our data, our figures properly so that the reviewers and the audience can read them clearly and understand them uh, easily. Okay. Uh, another review reviewer comment here, um, and this is uh, maybe not uh, re related to uh, directly to the data presentation, but you will also see this very often in these kinds of uh, review reviews. So the re related work is definitely lacking. A lot of work has been done already in WSN transport in recent years, but it is not referenced here. Please extend the related work section to bring it up to speed with the state of the art. Uh, I just put it here because uh, I noticed that uh, this is a common uh, weakness in, in, in our uh, EEE 198 uh, outputs and even the work, uh, some of the work of our uh, masters and PhD students. So, uh, so you should definitely look at uh, what has been already done in that area uh, and then reference them as much as possible. Because um, one thing that uh, I realize here that you should know is that some of these uh, reviewers, uh, they are experts in the field. So, so it could be that uh, they're looking for their own paper uh, in your, uh, to be referenced in your, in your paper. So, and uh, also they're looking at how uh, up to date your references are. Okay. So some other tips and tricks that I think in terms of uh, these are good practices that I think will help you in the way that you will uh, collect your data, uh, prepare for, for writing your manuscript, and even later on, when you have to go back and improve or uh, do further work on that uh, particular topic, that you will be able to easily uh, uh, use your data, your previous data, and even the way that you analyze the data. So number one is collect the data in an organized manner. So you should think about how you will collect and store the data. So, uh, so it's really a choice between using uh, open source formats or uh, proprietary formats. And you also have to think about where to store the data so that you can easily retrieve and or share that da the data with other people. Uh, one thing to note here is that you should always look, uh, uh, always have a backup, M make multiple backups of your, of your data, because otherwise when you lose your data set, uh, it's very painful and you may not have the time to recreate it or the resources to recreate your, your data. Number two, uh, consider the file formats. As I mentioned it could be closed uh, source or it could be open source. Uh, you, th you should think about uh, in the future, uh, what if I want to share that data with other colleagues? Uh, or uh, what if uh, some other researcher who, re who read your paper, they want to get a copy of your data because they want to recreate what you have done and they, want, they will compare their, their new research uh, over your uh, research. Okay. So that's why when you write a paper, a conference paper, or even a journal article, you put your, your name and your affiliation, your email address. And also uh, you have to indicate if there are many uh, authors who the corresponding author is, because they will, for people uh, who are interested to look at your work and to request uh, maybe your data set, you have to, they will contact you. They will contact the corresponding 
author. And of course, when you have a lot of data that you process and analyze, uh, you should think about automating it. So automate, automate, automate. How do you make it easy? Because uh, more often than that, you have to run your simulations, your data generation over and over again until you uh, finalize or, or uh, when you do the ref when you refine your algorithm or you, you refine your analysis. And also uh, when you have that data already, when you're writing your paper, you might need to recreate your graphs, your figures, your, your your results. So automating it using scripts, and I will tell you about uh, uh, the different tools and software packages that are available, uh, uh, and show you an example of how, how I did it for this uh, particular paper uh, okay, that, we're, that we're referencing in this uh, presentation. So, okay. Just to emphasize again, you might need to store and process large amounts of data. Always make multiple backups. In terms of uh, file formats, uh, your data could be stored in plain text, which is uh, very open because text, uh, as you can see, uh, unless you unless you compress it or or or. or encrypt it, uh, people will be able to open it uh, in any platform. Uh, okay, so you can also look at uh, some open source formats like uh, uh, Nuplot is a mm -hmm. graphical tool that's it's an open source graphical graphical tool that can generate figures. Okay, uh, in terms of proprietary formats you have the exit for example excel or, or matlab they have their own proprietary format they have their own scripting uh, tool uh, that you can use for automating in terms of writing your manuscript uh, you can use WYSIWYG tools what you see is what you get like uh, for windows you have word for mac you have keynote and for Linux, for example, you have the open office. Uh, you can also use a uh, document preparation system, uh, which is uh, LaTeX. And this is a very uh, good uh, document preparation system because number one is very, uh, there's a lot of tools and packages that allow you to write very complex figures or generate very complex figures. And in general, it's very easy, uh, very lightweight, uh, and uh, very, uh, and it's supported in almost all uh, operating systems. So there, this is very, it's highly portable in short. Okay. When you generate figures, uh, there's a choice between using a raster type, uh, figure or image uh, raster type means uh, there's a there's a there's a table of uh, values so x uh, there's a coordinates of uh, of uh, pixels okay uh, so one example here's png which is a lossless uh, format meaning um, when you save it in PNG, uh, even if there's uh, compression in, in the algorithm, you will not lose any image information. Uh, JPEG is a lossy, uh, on the other end, a lossy format. So you normally you'll see that uh, uh, JPEG um, would have a lower resolution okay, than PNG. Uh, on the other hand, the other type is vector uh, vector type. So a vector type of image or figure is made using um, um, uh, geometric functions. For example, using circles, polygons, lines, uh, connecting two points and so on. And uh, what is, uh, when you have vector, a vector type of figure, uh, 
the main characteristic here is that uh, uh, even if you resize the image, you will not you will you will have the same uh, resolution. Okay, so examples are uh, EPS or encapsulated postscript, PDF, and uh, the uh, Adobe Illustrator. Uh, this is, these are used by graphical artists. Uh, and, and in general, when, when writing uh, manuscripts for conferences and journals, uh, uh, what is used, uh, what is uh, recommended uh, is the EPS format, okay? And that's because uh, it, it's uh, still high, uh, the resolution that does not change, even if you resize uh, the image, okay? Yeah. So in terms of automating, you use the scripting tools uh, to generate your plots and your figures. So different um, programs uh, for, uh, for simulations and for, for generating graphs have different kinds of uh, uh, scripting uh, language. So for example, MATLAB and Octave, they're used for uh, mathematical simulations and computing. Uh, MATLAB is the proprietary uh, for, uh, software. Octave is the open source equivalent. And NuPlot uh, is the image uh, generation uh, software. It's also open source. Okay. But uh, what I'll show you later is how I used uh, MATLAB to generate the figures in EPS format, and uh, those figures were used in the in the conference paper. Okay, so here's the demo time. Okay, so I'll show you uh, what I did. So first, um, okay, I used uh, LaTeX, and LaTeX. In this case, I use a uh, Tech Studio as the front end is the is where I write the LaTeX code for the conference paper. And usually, for example, if you are uh, submitting to IEEE an IEEE conference, they will have they will already have a uh, LaTeX uh, template for for conferences for conference papers or journal articles. So you just what you do you just edit that uh, template and add your uh, add your uh, manuscript, okay? So, so as you can see, this is uh, in plain text, but there's a kind of uh, language here similar to HTML, for example. So there's like a markup, lang a mar markup language. But this is all uh, text. Okay, and when you, so here's where I put, for example, the names of the authors, affiliation, email addresses, and these are the parts of the paper. For example, the abstract part, the uh, keywords, and then the main body, for example. So here's the, there's a section for introduction. Okay, and then that's, this is the manuscript part already. Right. So, and then uh, you'll have uh, related work in this case as another section. And here you can cite, so the, you can cite uh, the different papers. Uh, okay, in this case, you'll see the, the details of, the, of this particular research paper, okay. And so I'll just show you an example of a figure. So in this case, this is a figure uh defined in uh, LaTeX. So what we did here is we're including a graphics file, okay, with some scale and we put a caption there and then there's a file name. Okay, so this file name is a actually an EPS uh, file. Okay, and you'll see this later. Okay. So, and then another one is when you have a, a table. So here's, uh, I'll show you just an example of a table, okay. All right. 
here. So begin table and end table. So this one is an example of a tabular format. Okay. So as you can see, there's already in just this one LaTeX file, you already have the example, the three types of uh, presenting data, textual information, uh, a table or tabular format, and then the figure, okay? okay, or graphical format here. So what I'll do is compile or build this and, and view the output. All right, so here's the output, uh, okay? Uh, so that's the title of the of the conference paper and these the authors and uh, affiliation and the email addresses so uh, if you recall uh, there's a part there where you have the abstract and then meron yung uh, index or the keywords and then the introduction section and and you'll see here for example so that's these are all generated from the latex file so there's a figure here, okay? So that's a diagram, okay? And then you'll see the table here. For example, this one is a table, okay? That's table one. Okay. Okay. So what is nice also in, in LaTeX is that it has other uh, tools. For example, you can uh, format uh, your algorithm nicely in this way so that you can show the, the algorithm, okay? All right, so so the question is, uh, okay, so there's an example here. There, it shows that we can either uh, use text in this case, there's text here, there's a table or there's a figure. So the question is, how did I generate it on figures? And all, okay, so of course, uh, what I did was I did simulations and then uh, based on those simulations, I generated data, okay? So when you have that data, uh, so as we said, you have to collect the data and store it in your preferred format. And then what we said was that we should then automate how we can, how we generate the figures, okay? All right, so so what I use here was um, MATLAB. So I, I have a simulator, but it, uh, the simulator is a network simulator. I, it's a, I did use MATLAB to simulate because there's a, um, that uh, network simulator has more functions and it allows me to implement this kind of uh, uh, simulation parameters. And remember that uh, we mentioned there are two scenarios, scenario one and scenario two. So here are the scenarios, okay? So here's the scenario one. Here you have a global hotspot and uh, scenario two is where you have a local hotspot. Okay? Basically uh, a hotspot is an area where you have uh, a lot of interference, okay? So global, you should be in all of them are experiencing really bad or really challenging uh, because they are wireless nodes, really challenging um, transmissions or, or, or communications between them. Ito, in this case, there's only a, a two nodes where you have a very challenging communications, okay? So, uh, so I, I use MATLAB, uh, MATLAB and I created a MATLAB uh, script. Uh, all the data, remember I, I collected all the data, all the data are stored in a MATLAB table called DRCN paper. And you'll see that when you look at the directory, okay, okay, mm, okay. All right, so when you look at the, okay, sorry, I think you're not seeing, so I'm showing, I'll show you the MATLAB, okay. Okay, so here's the MATLAB uh, interface, okay? So all that data from my simulations I stored in uh, a MATLAB uh, data file called DRCN paper, because this is uh, a paper that I submitted to DRCN uh, conference 
back in 2013. Okay. So uh, and uh, so this these are just MATLAB uh, programs or functions that get the that uh, get the data and then um, generate the corresponding figure. Okay. Okay. So as you can see uh, here on this uh, in the current folder, there's the DRCN paper MATLAB data file there and uh, this uh, function create figure win up is also in that directory okay so so this uh, that's this directory here this file here okay so it's another matlab script that generates this uh, particular figure so as you can see i just quickly uh, click that one, that's the function. And then what, inside that function, it's just really creating a figure. So that's why create figure, there's a figure name, you define the different axes, and then you get the data from the, from the, part, from the, um, from the uh, MATLAB uh, data file, okay, All right? So, uh, but what I'll show you is that when you create the scripts, you can now um, quickly automate the generation of the figures and then save those figures as in EPS format, uh, for example. So what I'll do is I'll just uh, run this script, okay? All right. Okay, so. So now you'll see, okay. Um, maybe you, I'll, I'll show you the the whole uh, desktop so that you can see. Okay. Is there a way to show the whole desktop? Okay. Okay here. Okay. So. Right. Okay, so maybe I'll just, so these are the, okay, All right, okay, I'll just show again and run the MATLAB script, okay, and show you that it generates, okay, the figures automatically, yeah, okay, so that's why when I click on, for example, figure one, okay, this is this figure okay from that is generated by this uh, function figure two is generated by this one because each one of this uh, matlab function uh, generates a figure so if i look at figure two then that is this one okay if you go back to our paper you will see that these are exactly these two figures uh figure 5a and figure 5b okay All right so so in short from here i can now then save this for example okay as for example a eps okay i can save it as a bmp so bmp is a raster format or jpeg or even png but uh, since I will use this uh, figure in LaTeX, then uh, the preferred format is EPS, okay. and it's a vector type of uh, figure. Okay. So, so once I generate all those EPS files, in fact, when you look at the uh, directory of my um, my directory where I stored all the, where I have the LaTeX file of uh, the conference paper, okay? Uh, imagine the conference, pa this paper of how many pages? I think this is eight pages. Uh, the uh, file size of the LaTeX file is 59 K bytes, okay? 
a very small file size. Yeah, if you did this in Word or uh, some other Word processor, it will be a lot larger. Of course, you have to also consider the EPS format, but if you look at the EPS format, uh, format they're also very small. They're not very big uh, files. Okay, so, right. So these are the sizes of the EPS here, for example. Win of that scene is the scenario one, win of cost, so 15k bytes long, okay, around that. Okay. So when you all when you generate all this, and I think uh, for this file size, uh, I think. Okay, let's go back to this and we generated this file. We save it as, I think, um, scene one win up. Okay, so if you look at this and scene one win up, uh, good protecting, and okay, and double click on it, that's that file. Okay, so it's exactly the same one here in this. Okay, this one, right? All right. Okay, and that's uh, a very small file size of 16 k okay. So what is nice about this is uh, when you are able to organize and automate everything, you can easily share these scripts to another colleague or maybe someone who's interested in your research and they can reuse uh, your, your data okay, and build on top of what you have done. Okay. All right. So, okay. All right. So I think that's uh, just a quick crash course, if you if you will, about the data presentation. Uh, and uh, if you are interested to know more, I would be happy to, to answer your questions later. Or if you can, uh, uh, if you want, uh, you can send me an email. Okay? Um, hopefully this uh, talk or mini tutorial uh, allowed you to learn more about how or think about at least get you started in thinking about how you will present your data okay. so i just leave you with an inspiration um, by kurt bollocker he's a computer scientist um, so he said that data that is loved tends to survive and i think this is is true when you take good care when you think about how you will collect and store and share that data later on that data that you have that you poured uh, your uh, blood sweat and tears uh, to, to generate and to analyze and then to communicate to your audience uh, that data will will tend to survive and be useful for for other people So thank you very much and hopefully you will enjoy uh, your research and also enjoy presenting it uh, when you have accomplished uh, your research. Thank you very much. <laughs>